Opera Cloud is bearing her grief quite bravely. Her grief? His funeral today instead of their wedding tomorrow? Fate is seldom so untimely cruel, Dr. Thorne. True, but I don't understand it. When I left town a week ago, he was enjoying the excellent health that has blessed him for, for half a century. And now, without a warning, without a symptom, all my instincts tell me that Edward Stapleton did not die of natural causes. Dr. Thorne, I examined and certified him myself. Oh, my dear doctor, I'm quite sure that in my absence you used every precaution. However, I'm going to do a post-mortem. But, sir, his cousins object to post-mortem. Without their sanction, you'd have to break into the tomb. They have no interest in Edward, only his fortune. He was my friend. I failed to return in time to forestall his funeral, but I mean to retrieve his body if I have to hire grave robbers to do it. I mean to know why he died. which separate life and death are shadowy and vague. Who is to say where exactly the one ends and the other begins? In certain mysterious maladies, all functions of vitality in the human body seem to stop. And then some unseen force sets the magic pinions and the wizard wheels in motion once again. The silver cord has not been cut. The golden bowl has not been broken. And the soul, one wonders. What meantime has happened to the soul? Many years ago, Edgar Allan Poe pondered the questions of mysterious sleeps and strange awakenings in a story entitled The Premature Burial. Well, we prepared a new adaptation of that story for you to enjoy tonight. And tonight, Poe's characters will be brought to life by... Patricia Medina as Victorine Lafourcade. Sidney Blackmer as Edward Stapleton. Marlowe is Julian Boucher. William Gordon is Dr. March. And this sinister gentleman is Dr. Thorne. as his name is Boris Karloff, this is a thriller.
convulsive muscle response. I've seen that before at post-mortem. Oh, not after so long a time. Note the tone of the tissue. Three days in the grave and no sign of decay. Well, I suppose some kind of poison might have affected preservation. No, no, no. Doctor, I'm going to try the galvanic battery. The battery? <laughs> but why? The man is dead. In that case, you can do him no harm. Fetch it. This method is new to me. A small incision between the serratus anterior muscles, and it's possible that direct contact with the charged wire may switch. Now! <laughs> safe in bed in my nursing home. Uh, You've been the victim of a most unusual seizure. For want of a more definitive term, we call it catalepsy. Mm. Do you understand? Edward, in the operating room last night, just before you swooned, you made an effort to speak. Do you remember what it was you tried to say? I am alive. So that was it. Can you call to memory your first moment of awareness, of reawakening? I have been aware of everything since the moment they pronounced me dead. Oh, Edward, what a dreadful thing. No dread to compare with it on Earth. Or in hell. In the casket, alive and aware. My throat is parched. Tongue will not obey. I try, I try to force the sound from my lips. March, Dr. March examines me. March, I am alive. March is not to be blamed. He found no pulse, no respiration, no corneal reflex, no sign of life. I, too, thought you dead. I saw you through closed eyes. I saw you. My whole being endeavored to shriek to you. I am alive. Something within me heard you. And you're saved. Help me, Thorn, help me. Put the knife in my heart. Don't let this happen again. Help me to die. Help me to really March, die. March. Help me. March! <laughs> Julian, darling, 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 Julian. Tell me you've never loved like this before. You know that's true. <laughs> but say it to me. <laughs> I'm not a poet, Victorine. You're a tormentor. Do I have to beg you for a tender word? <laughs> of course not. Darling, mm -hmm. I offer you my tenderest sympathies on your heartbreaking failure to become the wealthy widow Stapleton. Now, how is that, darling? Too tender? Julian, the months with Edward were not easy for me. 
I endured them only for your sake. I understand, darling. I owe you everything. And you owe Stapleton everything. And therefore, I am deeply in debt to his memory. He did love me, you know. Oh? Well, did he know that you had a friend to support? Or did he think that I was really renting this attic of he yours? He knew perfectly well that he knew nothing about you. Well, I think we abandoned the best plan, Victorine. I should have had that chat with him. I might have persuaded him weeks ago to salve my jealousy with gold. You are talking like a hateful child. I am a hateful child. I hate the time and the patience I've wasted waiting for you to get at Edward Stapleton's money. I hate being penniless because you couldn't make him marry you weeks ago. You ungrateful little urchin. I ought to... You ought to what? Throw me out? Be rid of me? Well, you do it. I will. No, you won't. Because it's exciting for you to possess an addict genius. A very young, impatient pauper who will use the back stairs discreetly. A suitor and a child for you, Victorine, in one young painter who flatters you on canvas, who helps you cling to the past and helps you put off the future. No, you won't turn me out, Victorine. You'd let go of almost anything else, but never, never me. May I have a word with you? No. No, Dr. Thorne, I'm not seeing anyone at the moment. I... I prefer to be alone. Miss Lavocard, I came to tell you you may put away your grief. Edward Stapleton is alive. Alive? But, sir, I saw him buried. Yes, so did I. But you see, his burial was premature. He doesn't look ill. Just terribly tired. Well, of course, you've already given him some measure of peace. But he will live in terror of being buried alive again unless we can destroy that fear. Though I've notified every medical man, every hospital, every undertaker in the county of his condition. And I'm giving him these to wear. A necklace and a bracelet for each wrist. Have you any idea what caused the attack? Well, I think that Edward blindly overexerted himself in an effort to compensate the difference in your ages. Sir, I made no demands on him whatsoever. It was he who liked hunting, boating and fishing. He had nothing to prove to me. I can well understand the reason for his vanities, Miss Lavocard. I mean only to warn you against them. From now on, there must be no more horseback riding, no more hunting, no physical exertion, no great excitement. An otherwise normal but temperate daily life. <laughs> Perhaps not ideal for a woman so young, but... But now you hope what you feared before. That I will marry him. For his sake, yes. It is your wish, too, is it not? Yes. Yes. Oh, yes, it is. Yes, I want the money. Because I want to paint. But I don't want him to have you. I wish he had stayed where he was. All right, I'm jealous. I suppose I'll never be happy until he's truly dead. Julian, darling, you shall be happy. I promise you, you shall.
Just a moment, Woods. Bring Mrs. Stapleton a glass of sherry in the library, please. I was sitting there, just there, and suddenly I could not move. My darling Edward, you're going to forget all about that awful night. You're going to be happy with me and afraid of nothing. Yes, yes. Now come along. No, wait. There's something I want you to see. What is it? I had it built during my convalescence. It is my sepulcher. Victorine, come inside, dear. I want to show you the secrets of it. Pull the door closed, dear. Victorine, if I should die or appear to die, no matter where or when, I am to be buried here. Now, I'll show you why. Touch the bar. You see, neither the coffin nor its occupant can fall from this shelf without striking the bar. But if by chance it should fail to spring the locks, then I have tin meats, biscuits and water here, and ventilation, of course. Blankets must be stored in the cabinet and perhaps a dram of good brandy. Now the details you can tend to at the time, we'll go over it again. Now the casket. The casket I have had made spacious and heavily padded. Small comfort, though. In fact, no comfort at all. It's a prison. It is the narrowest of prisons, but ingeniously constructed. You see, when I revived, when I fully comprehended where I was, I miraculously managed to rock my body back and forth, inside, against the sides, and I might again. I might! This time, if I do, let me show you. You see, no prison at all. This time, I escape. I am free. I am free. You suppose that I might not have the strength to deliver such a blow? This, too, I anticipate. No, no. This cord drops through the hole in the lid of the coffin. It needs but the gentlest tug from me. You are to place that cord in my clenched hands thus. Do you understand? Through the hole in the lid of the coffin and into my hands and close my fingers about it tightly, tightly. Edward, this is hideous. Oh, the bell, the bell above the door outside. I had the clockmaker balance it. It needs but the slightest tension. Do you hear it? Do you hear the bell, Victorine? It would stop it. Do you hear the bell? Promise me you will listen for it wherever you are. Please stop it. Do you hear me? You are not to bury me in the family vault or anywhere but here. Promise me that you will bury me here, that you will listen for the bell, that you will listen for the bell! Edward, stop it! Victorine, what am I to do? What am I 
Ich On his bold visage, middle age had slightly pressed its signet sage, yet had not quenched the open truth and fiery vehemence of youth. Forward and frolic, glee was there, the will to do, the soul to dare. Sir Walter Scott must have known you, Edward. It's you he's written about, the vehemence of youth, the soul to dare. That's you, my darling, you, you. <laughs> Why did you stop? Have I outdone you again? <laughs> I wanted to watch you. I wanted to think about our trip to Canada. Oh, you little minx. You are determined to take that trip, aren't you? I want to take the last shred of unhappy memory away. And banish it forever, my darling. Oh, what a perfectly wonderful shot. Let's go back to the lodge right away. I want to tell them that my husband is the great American hunter. Oh, my dear. I never dreamed I could be so truly happy, so truly free and happy. I'm... I'm delirious and very grateful. Please, Edward. Don't you be grateful. Let me be. I... I have something to confess to you. I have been haunted by fears and doubts about us. I've never been really, truly sure about our marriage until this trip. And now, every week away from home has been more wonderful than the last. Every... Edward, I... Stapleton. in our tribulations. For we know that we have a house not built with hands, which is eternal. Therefore, to that everlasting mansion, we commend thee, Edward Stapleton, and to the loving mercy of our Father, which is in heaven. Amen. Someone there? Oh. 
he's dead. <laughs> I got your letter. Come on, tell me how it happened. Well, we traveled for about nine weeks. And then three weeks ago, we decided... He decided to go hunting. He shot a deer. And the excitement overcame him. Is everything all right? Oh, everything, my darling, is perfect. No trouble? Oh, there were language difficulties, and I was terribly grieved. I'm afraid I behaved quite badly. I... <laughs> but I'm over it now. And now, at last, at last, I can give you everything I promised you. And now I understand from Pelier, the village doctor who examined Edward, that the necklace and bracelets I gave him for his protection were missing from his body. You must have thought that strange. I think it's strange that you're writing letters about my husband to someone hundreds of miles away. But it was my duty as his executor to make certain inquiries, which in turn led to the discovery that the medals were missing. Well, my answer to that would be that everyone in the village was poor and the medals were made of silver. You think they were stolen? Wouldn't surprise me in the least to hear the doctor himself had stolen them. The doctor? But you told me yourself that you were satisfied with Dr. Pellier's examination of your husband. I made him make two examinations. In your own mind, are you certain that Edward was dead? I wonder if you are aware of what you have just asked. I wonder how you dare. You must understand my concern. If a man as experienced as my own assistant, Dr. March, once made the mistake... Dr. Mistake. Thorne, I was under the impression that you came here today to discuss my husband's will. To be sure. He bequeathed his entire estate to you, but there is only one condition. He must be buried in the vault he built out there in the garden. That's impossible. He's hundreds of miles away. No great expense involved in bringing him home? Pagan, it's obscene. Did you persuade him to do this? It was his wish, as you must have known when you can find him in a coffin under foreign soil. I buried him there. Because that's where he spent the happiest days of his life, with me. I made him free and happy in spite of you. And you resent that, don't you? Madam, I never doubted for one moment that you would make Edward happy. As long as he lived. But I know he would want you to be practical now, on your own behalf. This, as you see, is an order from the probate court. If you will endorse it, I will go and bring Edward home. If you refuse, the court must award his estate to his cousins.
Victorine! Victorine? Victorine, where are you? Victorine! God, you're all right. I came the moment I got your note. Oh, oh Julian, I'm so alone. I'm so alone. Oh, that's it. The servants have deserted you. No, no, I made them leave. I didn't want them to know I'd sent for you. Oh, darling, you want me to marry you, and if I do, they're bound to notice me. Julian, there's something wrong. Are you ill? You don't understand. He's out there. <gasps> Darling, have you had a large glass of sherry? And if you haven't had, perhaps you'd better. We wanted Stapleton's money, and in a few days we shall have it. No! Turn off the lamp! Once the money is ours, we can leave this horrible mausoleum for good. And you can even take me with you if you wish. And as to dear old Stapleton, is that his precious vault? <laughs> well, let the old jack-in-the-box deteriorate where it pleases him. We probably owe him that, darling. There's a wind out there, and the wind caught the bell, and I'll go out and stop the thing. That was not the wind. He opened the door! He opened the door! <laughs> to be here. You're too upset. I'll be all right as long as we're together. I just want to make sure there's nothing wrong. All right, come see for yourself. No, no, I can't. I just want to make sure there's nothing wrong in there. Prankster, a crank, anyone, anyone who knew about that infernal vault, but not your late husband. Now, that's ridiculous. Then where is Edward? Where is his body? Oh, Victorine. Oh. Now, listen to me. Even supposing the man was alive when, when he was buried, 
He's been under the ground for six weeks. That's enough to kill anyone. His music. And that, too. Sir Walter Scott. He used to like me to read to him. Dr. Thorne would know about that, wouldn't he? The music, Sir Walter Scott in the vault, and what to do with the body. If Thorne thought I'd killed Edward, he'd simply accuse me. No, 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 he would not, because he couldn't prove a thing. <laughs> You must lie down. Julian, look at my bed. You told me you buried this. You told me Thorne believed you. I buried that. I took it off him and I buried it. And I buried his bracelets too. And he was watching me. That is ridiculous. He was alive. He was alive. Stop it. Stop it. <laughs> He's in the library now. That's his music. Giving over to this fear of something utterly impossible. Stapleton cannot be alive, and Thorne cannot be sure of anything. Now, the only sane thing to do is to bring the police. I want you to come with me. I don't want to leave you here alone, but I am going. You'll have to kill him, Julian. I see you, Thorn. You leave us alone. Leave us alone or I will. So help me, I'll shoot. Forgive me, but can I help? I rang the bell, but no one answered. Then I heard voices and... Oh, Mrs. Stapleton. It was never you. It was Edward. I was afraid this afternoon at the interment that she wasn't well. That's why I came by this evening. Do you swear you haven't been here all along? The vault is open, you were saying. Edward is alive? I do not say he's alive! can't be alive. Medically, that is inexact. Men have been known to survive long periods of cataleptic syncope. So, if he were alive, it is possible the long journey home has revived him. But you were with him all the way. You would have known that. You say he has seen you here? Sir, I am not even prepared to believe it's Stapleton. Then I wonder who it might be. Edward, is that you? 
Get him out of here! Edward, don't be frightened. Edward, Edward, it is I, Thor. see him? Yes, I see him. He wants to be with Victorine. No, you stop him! But she's his wife. He's alive. He wants to share his joy with the woman who loves him. He wants revenge. She doesn't love him, she loves me. She'll say she did it all for me. Accuse her of burying him alive and knowing it. Well, isn't there proof? The medals and the necklace and the bracelets. She took them off him and she buried them under a stone. Now you'll see. He'll show you. He found them. He knew all the while. Dr. Thorne. Perhaps you can help me. He's lost his necklace. I'm trying to persuade him he should wear it. Dr. Thorne, he should let me give it back. Edward, won't you come down? No! You have nothing to fear, have you? Edward, here's your necklace. Doctor, I meant him no harm. But you did know he was murdered, didn't you? No! No, make him stop, please, please, I'm sorry. Do you accuse this woman? Yes, I do. I accuse her! I knew! I knew! I'm sorry! I'm sorry! I'm sorry! Missed you. Why? Why did you do this to us, Dr. Thorne? I went to see where my friend had died. I found one stone with no moss on it. It had been overturned. And I found his necklace and bracelets hidden under that stone. And in his coffin, I found a man who had been murdered. 
by torture. A murder that I could not prove. This is Edward Stapleton's death mask. Taken from his face. Dr. Thorne. Since you were kind enough to give this to my husband, perhaps you will see that he wears it. It's quite important. Really quite important. <laughs> 